Hey, yo, it's me, Pops Fan Marmalade, and you're watching the Comics Related Madness Network. Uh-huh. So come get some. Cromcon. Cromcon. Entertainment Group presents the Madness Comic Network with original programming and additional comic related content. Hey, we want to shout out to our sponsors, Daytona Beach Comic Con. If you are a fan of comic books, if you're a fan of comic book conventions, and if you like meeting comic book creators and getting comics and comic related stuff, then you need to make your plans to attend Daytona Beach Comic Con. This year's show is September 9th and 10th. Silverline will be there, so you should make your plans to be there too. We'll see you there. If you like comics and find yourself in the Orlando, Florida area, I mean, doesn't everyone come to Orlando at some point in time to see the House of Mouse? But when you're here, you need to make it a point to visit Coliseum of Comics, especially the one on East Colonial Drive. They carry Silverline Comics, even a limited edition Coliseum of Comics version of our comics. So, when you go, be sure to ask for Silverline Comics and tell them we sent you. OCD stands for Orlando Collector Deviants. OCD, Stephen Trish. They're a family of geeks who promote geek things, particularly those around the Orlando, Florida area. They're big supporters of Silverline, and we think you should be supporters of theirs, too. Go give them some love. If you are an independent comic book maker and you need to get your independent comics made, you need to look no further than Kablam! Kablam Digital Printing. They print our books, and they do a bang-up job. They're not only trusted by Silverline, but many, many independent comic book makers. Head on over to Kablam.com and see for yourself just how easy it is to have your comic printed by them. And tell them Silverline sent you. Hi, this is Tim TK, host of That Silverline Show on Tuesday. Join us at 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific, every Tuesday night as we discuss pop culture and the joys of making comics. Hi, I'm Barb Kelber, co-host of Silverline's Wednesday Wham. Join us each Wednesday night as we discuss comics, literature, movies, and anything else that may catch our attention. I'm Roland Mann, and I host Silverline's Silver Sunday. Join me every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern as we make mine Silverline. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Silver Lines Silver Sunday on this Sunday night, October 22nd. I am your host, I am Roland Mann, and I am here with a uh, regular new top troublemaker, Mr. Tom Mason. Hey, everyone. How's it going? And we are joined by Tuesday regular, Mr. David Rios. How you doing? I am doing. I am doing well. Uh, I got a message that our regular Tommy uh, Flormonti is trying to get in, so I think he will be here uh, momentarily. Uh, we're going to run the video at the end of the show, but I want to remind you guys that we've got a Kickstarter going, and uh, you can get these sweet, awesome, beautiful foil versions. This is the only place that you can get uh, these foil covers. So you guys need to get on over to Kickstarter and 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 back these and get these. Uh, you can still get the books after the Kickstarter is over, but you won't be able to get these sweet foil cover editions, and they look so good. You know, we've tried to yeah. take picture. We try to take pictures of these. Uh, I scanned them. We photographed them, and you just they just it, none of those. You, you they kind of have to move. 
because you have to see them moving to, to get the pure understanding of, of what's here. You need a TikTok video is what you need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like we, we do have TikToks. There you go. We do. We do have TikToks. Problem solved. Uh, so I'm very happy to announce that uh, after uh, weeks and months and maybe years of uh, sending this guy a message and said, hey, man, join us. Hey, man, join us. Okay. It can't have been years. We haven't been streaming for that long. Uh, we are finally joined by Mr. Hank Knoltz. What is up, Mr. Hank? Hey, hey, how are you guys? Hey, good, Hank. Good to see you. Yeah, it has been years, actually. You started asking <laughs> me uh, in 21, 2021. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, Here I, we are I, in uh, 2023. We, we started streaming, I think, in, uh, in either 18 or 19. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been asking you for a while. I know that. Uh, and every time you're like, uh, well... Uh, Maybe later. Let me let me get something to talk about. I yeah. said, "Hey, can I talk about this?" And you're like, "No, no don't talk about that." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we are joined finally by Mr. Tommy Spooky Flormonti. Yeah, I'm trying to get. Hold on. Just continue. <laughs> pretend like I'm not here. All right. Uh, so I hope something, shows up. So hey, so thank you, Hank, for uh, for dropping in. We're gonna we're gonna talk all about you tonight, Hank. Oh. <laughs> my least favorite topic all the time. All the time. <laughs> so uh i'm gonna start I, I have a whole list of questions but uh -oh. I, I will have to stop myself and, and let the others ask questions but i am gonna get it started um, you, you didn't send any of them to me either so i'm like you know what the heck is he gonna ask me about <laughs> no well fact. you know you've done me long enough I, if i if i do ask you something that you don't want to answer just say ro yeah what are you doing but I don't, I don't think I will. Or you can just um, turn your your computer off and then. <laughs> you could do you can do uh, rage quit. And walk off stage. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, so so you've been working in comics for a long time now. Right? Long time, eighty eight. So so what we want to know is, is how did you get your start? Where 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 did it all start? Where did Hank first Ooh. work in comics? Well, there's like the origin, and then there's that pre-origin that gets written after the origin story. Well, yeah, <laughs> I have a picture I'm going to ask you about. Uh, all right, <laughs> but, but 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 I want you to tell the story first. So well, so it, it's it, I, I mean technically, it, my first job in comics was bagging comics for a store called Remember When. This is so I, I had. I'd gone to my first comic book convention in 1983. So you, you're diving deep. My first ever <laughs> comics convention was comics uh, was in Houston. It was the Comics Fair in 1983. Uh, Mike Grell did the T-shirt. Just distinctly remember it. I remember meeting him. I met uh, Bill Willingham with, when he was with Texas Comics. The Elementals sure. were like wow. just coming out. Um, super back. cool convention. My my parents you know, decided to drive me down there and they, we made a weekend of it. So they were like supportive of my going to this strange gathering of people. Um, and then uh, and then there's the comic shop. Uh, I grew up in Richardson, Texas. There's a comic shop. Remember when? And uh, there's also this great flea market. And in the flea market was a, a half price books, um, which carried comics. So between those two shops, I would go in on Saturdays and bag comics. Just I would just sit there and bag comics. Uh, they didn't do boards back then, so it was just bagging, not bagging and boarding. And I would do it for credit, for store credit. Smart guy that I was. Um, you get more money with store credit than you would in cash. So, uh, you had but, to have your comic book fix, of course. And the best thing about bagging comics for comic book shops is you get first dibs on all the comics that come in. Oh. So as you're bagging the comics, you put aside the ones that you want. And, you know, you know you have a problem when you're putting aside more comics than you actually put out on the floor <laughs> to buy them. But, uh, but I did that for a long time. And then uh, the comics fairs and the comics festivals hit the Dallas area. Um. And uh, there is a there is a great dealer, Paul McSpadden, who had me bagging his comics. So he would he would drop off like ten to fifteen long boxes at my house on any given day, and I would bag them and alphabetize them, and um, and have them ready for him for his. Con he would go around con and do conventions, so he he'd pick them up. So a lot of trust there because you know dropping off. 
10 long boxes, uh, but he would bring in so much uh, Silver Age stuff. It was fantastic. Wow. So even if I didn't, even if I didn't buy them, uh, I ended up reading a, a ton of them, just bagging his collections. Yeah. Um, and then I uh, so remember when the owner of Remember When passed away. So the the store was sold to a guy named Bob Wayne, and uh, oh, this yeah. was eighty nineteen eighty five. So I I got a job at the, uh, he just remodeled the shop, uh, really made it super nice. Um, started working for him in eighty five. And then my family moved to California. Uh, so my, my, my dream job in high school finally had working like legit for an actual paycheck, not for store credit, uh, working on a comic shop and had to move to California after that. So did you know Larry uh, Langford by any chance? I did. I did. Okay. Uh, he, he ran the, uh, uh, Tommy, do you remember him? Who? Larry, Larry Langford. He, the Dallas Fantasy Fair was yeah. yeah. Oh, did the, he, must yeah. have because we I I did several of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we did the shows uh, in there in the late eighties, early nineties with Larry Langford at the Dallas Fantasy Fair. That was yeah. that was, was, that was a, really good. good there was a us. thing that there was like a whole Texas mafia of comic book guys. Then they call mm. and then they call themselves buddy, like the Texas mafia or something where they yeah, were just what was his buddy uh, buddy Lone Star guy uh, Buddy Saunders. Yeah. yeah, Buddy Saunders. Buddy Saunders. Yeah, Saunders. Yeah. Yeah. Lone Star in my comic shop. So yeah, so I moved in 85. Uh, so the, the Dallas Fantasy Fairs and Fantasy Festivals, summer and fall, right? I think it was like maybe July and November yeah. every mm -hmm. year, give or take. Um, so one year I did the uh, Dallas Fantasy Fair, um, met up with some folks at DC um, and Eclipse and Marvel because they all had their little booze there. And then uh, when I moved to California, went to the San Diego show, uh, same summer. So I saw the same people and you know, the shows were smaller, but everyone recognized me. And they're like, didn't we see you in Dallas? <laughs> and, uh, but that's when I moved. And then I had to go back to, to Texas uh, for a family thing in November. So I hit the, what, whichever the festival or fair was for November. And I saw a lot of the same people there. And it was when I was trying to break in. And so the, the, the advice you're given, you're, it's still good advice today is like, get to know yep. editors, right? Yep. Uh, and go to conventions and meet them at conventions. And so I apparently made an impression uh, by going to these conventions and um, kept in touch, uh, wrote a, a few of them back and forth. And in 88, um, I, I broke in with uh, the DC bonus book program. It was a new talent program that they were doing. It, it, it eventually evolved into the DC new, new talent showcase. But before yeah. then, it was the DC bonus book program. And it was uh, all, all their books had short stories that were inserted into the middle of the books. So I got to write the um, the origin story of Red and Blue Trinity, uh, which were the Russian speedsters um, for the Flash comic. So uh, it was uh, I think it was it was Mike Barron and probably Butch Geis working on it, uh, the main book. And then Bill Knapp and I got our first big break uh, doing that story this is flash number flash number 19 and 1990 wow. did you get in did you get in through neil posner was he the uh no was... so i i got in through barbara randall um oh, okay. she became barbara randall kiesel kiesel um but she left dc so she hired me I, so here's here's what happened is i wrote a spec script that i sent it in to her she was the editor of teen titans i was a huge new teen titans fanatic um so I wrote a, a Speedy and Cheshire story and I sent it into Barbara and she sent me a really nice letter back saying, don't ever do this again. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't just, you don't just send a script in. Um, right. it's so many problems, right? I'm a teenager, had no idea. I right. figured if I wrote a full script that would impress them and you know, I, everything I'd read is if you do these spec scripts and people are, are, they see what you can do. Don't do that, she said, because if I read this and then... Um, Marvin yeah. and I end up doing a, a speedy story that takes any elements of your script. I'm in trouble. It's like, oh, right. I'm so sorry. She goes, so, but I read your script and it looks like you know what you're doing. So now I'm going to find something for you to do it on. So she put me in the bonus book program. Then she left DC. I was crushed. She's fantastic. We we and we've stayed in touch. We see each other uh, at conventions still. And uh, but Joey Cavalieri came on board and uh, uh, took over the bonus book program. So. Technically, Barbara was my first editor, but Joey's the one who actually edited my first story in comics. Huh. 
There you go. Vic Dew says, uh, okay, so my harassment of Roland is a good idea. <laughs> yes. Send him a Teen Titan Specs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, it, it was, it was, a, it was, I mean, you read it now and it's like, oh my God. But at the time, I thought it was like the greatest thing. Um, <laughs> And and the and it would picked up on a thread that you know so Speedy Speedy would get into all sorts of trouble. He was the bad boy of the Titans, right? But he had a he had a, a love affair with Cheshire, the, one of the Titans' uh, biggest villains. They're all big villains, um, and they had a they had a kid. And so that was the that was, the story was how she got him hooked back on drugs because he had to go undercover to bust a a drug ring in probably Shanghai or somewhere, you know. Somewhere stereotypical. So, uh, uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, my my buddy Rob Liefeld did a nice little little cover piece for it. So when I sent it in, it was like it was a complete. Hey, here's the here's a complete story. <laughs> you did it all. Yeah. It's just princess now. So, <laughs> and Rob ended up getting a bonus book as well. He did. Um, so was he your buddy from? So we, so you see your buddy Rob Liefeld. So. I know that you and you and uh, Rob are, are buddies, but where, when did this happen? Was this so, so I was still in Texas? School, I had, school buddies? Yeah, no, no. I, was, um, I was still in Texas, still in high school, and I was a part of an an, an APA, an APA, oh, yeah, Amateur yeah. Press Association. It was called Titan Talk. Uh, it was started by Margie Spears Sasky, Sasky, uh, and I, I I think I found out about it through a letter column in in one of the Titans books. I told you I was a big Titans nut. Um, and so I joined up. I joined the waiting list. There were all these things. That, this was pre-internet. So there were things called uh, APAs. There was Interlac. There was Titan Talk. There was XAPA. There were all these fandoms that would they would put together uh, your minimum. It was called a MyNet, minimum activity. And it was a contribution. So it could be fan fiction. It could be art. It could be commentary on comics. And then you would photocopy it or mimeograph it 50 times or however many Right. your APA was, you send it into a central mailer, central mailer will collate it, and then send it out to everybody. Um, so a, a lot of us got our, were you a member? Uh, not of that one, uh, not of the team. Yeah. I, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember the one I belong to. Paul Dale Roberts was the guy who ran it, and I can't remember the name. So many, that, well, so many of the, uh, the Dark Horse people came out of APA 5. Yeah. Because that was Paul Chadwick and uh, Randy Stradley and Mark Verheiden. Yeah, and cool. A bunch of others. Yeah, a lot of people got their start. So Rob and I uh, connected there, and he was he lived in Anaheim, and I lived in Texas. But then when I moved to California, I looked up how far Anaheim was from Corona, which is where I moved to. It wasn't that far. It was, I mean, it's far enough when you don't have a car. But um, you know, once I got my driver's license in the, in the car, no, not in California. <laughs> um, I assume that meant hitchhike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, I assumed you were old enough to know that. So <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, so so when I moved, it's just like you know you find you have to find your people when you move, and so yeah. uh, uh, Rob and I connected, hit it off pretty well, and you know that's that's where we are. So so he got uh, he was breaking he was trying to break in at the same time, uh, so he drew sample pages. It's so it's it's a lot different i'm not gonna say it's harder or easier um but it's a lot easier to to get your work seen when you're an artist because you oh can, absolutely you can just yeah. look at the art it's a lot harder for a writer to get their work read because you know every, every editor well, myself it takes a little more effort yeah. well yeah. I, yeah. I mean i mean hey this is the thing you can, I do you, can you can tell in five seconds about the art do I want exactly to read right. more? Or do I want to read more. And with the writing, it's like, ah, no, I got to sit here and read this. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the kind of thing that I, I, I do in my class, right? I'll, uh, well, crap. I can't find anything right now. I'll, um, <laughs> of course, I can't find. I have no. T I have nothing but images here. Uh, uh, you know, I, it's the kind of thing where. Oh, here we go. So, you can do this, right? I can hold. I can hold this up. You can immediately decide, oh, I like that or I don't like that, mm -hmm. right? Right. Hey, do you like this story? What do you think? <laughs> right? Right. Right. It's right. a lot of words, Roland. Yeah, right. So Exactly can, right. I'm, yeah, I'm not so, reading it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Writers are it, – it's a lot harder for a writer in a visual medium mm -hmm. to get your work seen. But that's why – sorry to interrupt it, but it seems like 
that's why it's better to do what Hank was saying, which is like to just go around and meet people. Right. And let them let them see that you are you're not a stalker or some weird person. <laughs> and then it becomes easier to go like after the third or fourth or fifth convention that you meet the same person. And it's like, uh, yeah, I, I could read something. You're OK. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. It's it, just, it works better. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think they I think they get a gauge as to whether or not they would want to work with you. Right. Yes. Like personality. And and um, well, we say that all the time. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter how good you are. You don't if you don't gel with the person that you're working with, you just don't want to do it. Yeah, because exactly if, you, right. if you figure out how long it takes to do like even a four issue miniseries, that's easily 10 months or a year. It's yeah. like, do I want to spend a year married to this person? Emails or <laughs> Zoom calls with this person. And sometimes no matter how talented they are, the answer is just no. No. Right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Now we got to go out and promote this book together and right, right, possibly right. do shows together at some point or another. It's like, I don't want to even sit next to this person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Roland's here. Oh, sorry, Roland. <laughs> so does that, uh, have we moved up to the picture or did the pictures? Uh, I, I don't think, I think we're getting mighty close to the picture. All right. Uh, all right, so Rob and I headed off. Uh, we we at the same time. Um, I like everyone. I think I wanted to start. I wanted to be a comic artist, and um, yeah, I was awesome. I uh, know. <laughs> discovered that you know it's a lot harder. I mean, it's a, it's it's a lot harder and a lot more time consuming um, to to draw and draw well and draw. Yeah panel to panel to panel to panel and tell a story. And, tell a story. and, and you know, I knew, I knew that wasn't uh, in the cards for me, but I, at the same time, I also wanted to start making some money as a writer. Um, so I, I did a lot of comics journalism. I worked for a uh, comic scene magazine, uh, which is a terrific publication by the star log folks. Um, I think it was uh, a isn't it? <clears throat> uh, uh, Pat uh, McDonald is, I think, yeah, Eddie oh, yeah. Braganza, a DC editor, was an was a was an intern and then an, uh, became an editor at at they did like Starlog and Fangoria and Comic yeah. Scene and a couple other things, right? Um, so I did I did a few uh, interviews and articles for them, um, and then uh, uh, through through Titan Talk, Rob and I had developed uh, a Titans West concept that we were kind of playing with in um in titan talk and uh he pitched it to dc and dc was like this is great but uh, you've got to find a name writer because nobody knows this hank fella yeah. um and and to his credit rob was you know like yeah, well it, i mean we co-created it so you're not gonna happen um and it, so it morphed into something called young blood and then um, pitched it back. And again, DC said, this is great, but you got to find another writer. Just try not to take it personally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was yeah. it was actually going to be published by a company called Megaton Comics uh, way oh. back. And, uh, and, and then... Is it Don Simpson? Uh, no, that's, I think was, uh, that's the guys who were doing... Uh, they were the first publishers of Eric Larson's Savage Dragon. Also correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Don Simpson might have had one of his comics there too. Megaton is Gary Carlson. Uh, yeah. I want to say okay. out of I want to say out of Illinois. Yeah, so I was going to say Chicago, Chicago, but it's, yeah. uh, it's uh, or Evanston. It's somewhere in that that big city circle, I think. Yeah. Um, gosh, and then I mean, I think like one of the earlier pieces <laughs> that uh, Rob did this great wraparound cover that Jerry Ordway inked. This beautiful piece. Um, yeah, uh, uh, so, so that didn't happen. Um, but right around that time, uh, Rob was studio mates with Jim Valentino and he, uh, he was really making a name for himself on, uh, New Mutants and, uh, a book called X-Force. Yeah. These little, these little things little that you might've heard about. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, so right around that time, it's like that, that's when the, the ideas for Image Comics started uh, forming. And then uh, Youngblood became the, the flagship title 
for the launch of, uh, of Image Comics that was published and distributed by Malibu Comics. Which brings me to my picture. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so it doesn't take one very I mean you can easily Google Who is the, that goofy bunch of people? <laughs> <laughs> the first the first picture of the image founders. And this yeah. this picture comes up. Now this fella right here is almost always called Will Spertacio. Yeah. <laughs> Will <Wolfner, laughs> feel bad so, for Wills. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of the things that that uh that uh, I wanted to to ask you about is that um Oh, shoot, I covered up my. How do I get rid of it? Uh, stop screen. Um, I can't see my controls. But my, okay. Uh, so this was this was early, clearly early image. Um, that was early image. So that was a that was a meeting at Mark Silvestri's house in um, ninety one. Yeah, Southern California. Probably ninety one. Yeah, probably ninety one. Ninety one, ninety two. Yeah, because I, I know, know I know that Dave and Chris and I were at Mark's Beach House with most of you guys, and we were there in the fall of 91. Right. Because we closed the deal in December of 91. Yeah. And that would have, like, and, and I think it was Mark's house because it was sort of centrally located because you had Jim down in San Diego, you had Rob up in Anaheim. Um, Wizard Magazine was there, sort of to yep. chronicle the and the and the uh, the newsstand guys. I forget who the, what they yeah what the name was, but they were there too. And uh, Johnny e was there. Um, so it, it was it was weird though because they wanted to take a picture and they insisted. That I I, I being I I've, I've said this every time. This this picture always comes up, and every <laughs> anniversary it. it always <laughs> comes up. I didn't want to be in the picture, but uh, but Garab made me be in the picture so i'm in the picture and he actually said he actually said this is like the first picture of the beatles and um so he he made prints of that picture and he sent it to all of us and it's, it's in this gold frame i've got it somewhere um and that picture always comes up so so at one of the first conventions after that picture hit um and and image had rightfully uh properly launched Everyone would come up and bring their Wetworks comics <laughs> and propaganda, you know, posters. And Mr. Wills, Mr. Wills, will you sign this for me? And it's just, oh my gosh. And Will Wills should have been in the picture. He wasn't at the meeting. He was in the Philippines dealing with some family issues, so he yes. couldn't he couldn't be at that meeting. Um, so yeah. So for the longest time, a lot of people thought I was Pratacha, and then we should started photoshopping my head. They would, so, oh, they well, so so actually, they would do a nice little inset, and that was okay because, and but they would cover me, which <laughs> sucked. So they would put the inset over my over my body and face. Oh but no! Then, they, then someone had the bright idea of putting Will's like photoshopping Will's head on my body. No which, way! Yeah, and 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 I love Will's. Uh, yeah. But it didn't. It it wasn't right. It was so it, was, it was like a Franken Wills, and uh, and it was just bad. And then I, I even think the uh, the DC documentary that was just on Max uh, uses that picture, and they they did they either picked up a picture with Wills's head photoshopped on me, or they covered me up, which you know, kind of rude, but. Yeah. What can you do? But it comes up every time. And yeah. and to their credit, like, you know, when you look at uh, when there's ever an anniversary, like Eric will always mention who I am and or Todd or, or whoever else is running the picture. So and it was it was. Oh, actually, um, e e even a regular uh, a listener here, uh, Hank, Vic says, I'm going to be real. I thought you were uh, Protasio for a good year and a half. Right. Yeah. <laughs> The um, shoot, where is it? Get all these Gemini mailers on my desk. You want to talk about piles? But this was the coolest thing. It just happened recently too. You guys know Local Man by Tim Seeley. Let's see if this. I've heard of it. Oh yeah, I've yeah. I've seen it. I haven't picked it up yet. It's a it's a great read. Everyone, um, here we go. So this is what they drew in. I don't know if you can see that, they uh, there we go. Oh yeah. So they, <laughs> They took the picture. They made that's it, great. So That's they fun. made everybody there a superhero. 
uh, <laughs> except for me, but they kept, the, which is fine because they, they kept me like they didn't make me Wolf's Protasio. Uh, they right. kept me in the same, uh, I don't even know what I was wearing, some sort of shirt on over a shirt thing. Um, it was and, like, uh, there's that guy again. Let's put this in. <laughs> hey, we, 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 we got a great comment here, Hank. Uh, from Crunchy Wonton says, This is Charlene. Hank, prove you aren't Wills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're never in the same spot at the same time, right. in, the, in the same place at the same time. Oh, but, uh, there is something going on there. But, uh, so, so, uh, Tim, Tim, and uh, Tony tweeted that out when it came out, and it, and it was really, he goes, Every super team needs a Hank Knopf's on their team. So that was like, <laughs> that was really nice. That is cool. That You're the guy was, in the chair. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy didn't read my notes. Oh, no. Do you need a guy in the chair? That was one of my well, topics. Yeah, it's, it's, it was one of my topics for an upcoming uh, uh, stream. Well, don't don't send me the script ahead of time then. <laughs> no. <clears throat> you may so, say, I need mm -hmm. to shave my head and put on Cerebro. And... That's right. <laughs> That's right. So Find how did you get there, Hank, uh, from there to uh, working with Malibu? Oh, that's a great story. Yeah, let's hear it. I don't know if my story will match yours, but it's a great story. Uh, I was so I was writing this book called X Mutants for Malibu. <laughs> it was um, Paul Pelletier, fantastic artist, uh, super nice guy. Um, I I I didn't get to start the series. I think I joined the series with issue number four. Um, so did, did I well. eat those? Was, I it, eat was it this one, one of right here? No, that no, came that, later. That's Zillion. That came later. Ah, sorry. But uh, yeah, but uh, issue four. Sorry. But not not uh, not too far after that. Um, so I was writing. I was writing X Mutants, and uh, they had these rules. And it's like, okay, well, you can't give them superpowers. Um, you you can't kill any of them. I know uh, this is going. I've heard this before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were there. I hope you did. <laughs> so that was going pretty good. It was it was selling all right. You know, truth be told, I think Tom and Chris uh, were hoping to to uh, kind of bring in new readers to the series based on the success of the image stuff. Um, and Roland was an editor there, and he uh, ended up taking over the series, or was on the series. Um, and I remember getting a call from him after I turned in my script, saying, "You know, thanks, thanks for your script. Uh, uh, you're fired." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was nice, Roland. And I was like, "What?" And he goes, "But, but I want you to, I, you know, well, I should probably back up because this was done in person. To be fair." Roland said, you need to come into the office. We want to talk to you about something. So we go into the office, and that's when he's going to drive it all the way in to get fired. You're, you're fired. fired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he wasn't quite said in those words now. Come on, you guys. Give me some credit. Roland, <laughs> it, it actually it actually was. You said you, you said, like, we're gonna take the series in a different direction, so we're gonna have to fire you. But <laughs> we do have a job here if you're interested in joining. And we'd love to have you. And that's pretty, you know, maybe I'm paraphrasing, but uh, but that was the gist of it, which is why he wanted to see me in person, as I recall. It was you and Chris, and I think I think uh, Duo uh, Dave Albrich was there too. But it was definitely you and Chris, because I I think you were all like, I gotta fire this guy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> One of you's got to be with me, so you can offer him the, the sap job, yeah. <laughs> stop on the blow. You know, um, so after some consideration, I, I joined I joined up uh, on the editorial staff mm -hmm. and uh, and then I, I edited Zillion and I also edited uh, some Robotech comics. Mm -hmm. You, you um, did all of the, the like. Um, if I remember correctly, didn't you do like all of the Eternity books? I don't think so. I was thinking, I was thinking that was what before the Ultraverse came along. You did all of the, uh, all of the Eternity books, which were at the time pretty much just the the manga inspired stuff. Well, oh yeah, okay. So if if it was Robotech and Zillion, then sure, <laughs> I did all of them. <laughs> but uh, there was also there was also the Gigantor book, and then uh, I think Eternity two and one or something like that, which was I didn't uh, do those. Okay. You, I thought I think, you did Gigantor. I think I think Danko did those. He was the writer. Oh, editor. 
Okay. Well, I may be remembering huh. wrong then. So I have a question based huh? off of X Men. Uh -oh. <laughs> because I did read those. Actually, I did screw up by showing the Zillion one, but um, which I still have is did you have any involvement in the X Mutants Sega Genesis game? I did not. No. Nobody that did. Storyline huh? that was all just completely uh, separate. So we. From so the way. The way that works, and I I think this is correct, is that. We had merged with Bob Jacobs' company, Acme Interactive, and they had become Malibu Interactive. And what happens is that um, it's it's like the, this weird one-two punch where um, we held the rights to the X-Mutants title. Uh, Sega licensed the rights from us with the understanding that Sega would then hire Malibu Interactive, our video game division, to actually make the game. And, and so, so we, we sort of double-dipped in a sense, we get paid the licensing fee, and then we get paid the production fee. Um, but we didn't. I need your nobody, notes on how to do that. <laughs> nobody on staff at the comic book side was involved in the storyline or the stuff of the game. Okay. That was all sort of tightly controlled by uh, the interactive side and by Sega. Okay, cool. And just a side side note on the Zillion stuff. The reason I bring this up is that um, this was my first published work. Nice. Which was the backstory in, in the back of this that Mr. Knolfs wrote the story. And a penciler that I knew penciled it and I inked it. So I was very happy, very happy with it. So there you go. There you go. That there is you go. awesome. Small uh, world keeps getting smaller. That is exactly. fantastic. Uh, hey, man, it's the first I realized this, this, this whole, the whole stream tonight. All, all has a, no. a Malibu connection. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. realized that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are, we are, but, Roberto, hey, you need to say hi. I didn't hi. get to say hi. So. That's right, hey. you didn't. So, Roberto, say hey, hi. Hey, hey are Roberto. You? Hi. <laughs> it's been years. Nice to see you. I know nice I have. You. I actually saw you last week uh, when you were with Jim Chadwick on your, oh, on your cool. stream. But, uh, all right. Well, kind cool. of. I didn't see you. Yeah. You did not. It was, he was lurking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I, I watched the the replay. I actually didn't know that Chad goes on until Roland mentioned it, and I was too late. So then I just watched it that night, though. Oh, cool. it, was, it was it was a great time. So, yeah. so when we yeah. were we were when we were backstage before we went live, Roland and I were talking about the sort of the Hank connection, how Hank got involved in Malibu, and one of the things that I <laughs> where he uh, said I had to fire him. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Hang, bang, son, you're out of here. But here's good. They've got good news. I got bad news. What you want? Oh, to do? That sounds just like Roland. I was. I had to look up to see who was talking. <laughs> the thing is, though, like as soon as he fired me, he gave the ex mutant superpowers, which is like he told me <laughs> that's you're not what I was waiting for. <clears throat> you can't. Oh, here's the here's the thing. Not trust Roland. That's a, that's the key. That's the takeaway. Because the the thing that's that's weird is that. People always talk about how to break into comics, and it's like your story is sort of uh, an example of one of the ways to do it. Yeah, which is we met you through Image because mm -hmm. you were you were associated with Rob, mm -hmm. and then and the more the more you kept coming up to the office, the more it's like, do you see any red flags with Hank? No, I don't see any red flags with Hank. And just well, let's go to lunch with him. Now let's let's have Hank come up more, and then. It's like, well, let's get him a job writing a comic book because we like him because he's here. So we'll give you the X-Moons job. And then it's like, yeah, well, it's the X-Moons thing. We like Hank. I still don't see any red flags. He's been coming up here for like a year and a half. If he's going to explode or be difficult, we'll know by now. <laughs> right? why, don't we make him, why don't we make him an editor? Let's bring him on staff because, you know, you mesh well with the other guys. And that yeah. way we don't have to we don't have to go out and date another editor to yeah. see if there's a good fit yeah. because you're already you're already attached. You're already in the orbit. And, 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 you know, Jim, Jim Chadwick uh, reinforced that idea last week. He said, you know, it's all about networking. It is. It know? is. So, yeah, uh, it Hank, is. we got to, uh, before we move on, uh, Vic has a couple of questions here. I think Tom okay. will probably be better suited to answer this one, I think. Well, it's not uh, it's, Vic, it's Hank's show, so save those for next time. It, well, Vic says, uh, was Dark Wolf still kicking when uh, you were at Eternity, Hank? No. I don't think so. Yeah. Tom, Tom says no. You remember Dark Wolf, don't you, Tom? I do. All, all those yeah. When we went, when we switched over, um, Dark Wolf was uh, returned to Butch and, uh, and R.A. So because they, yeah. they own the rights. 
Um, and so that's when it, that's when we switched over from creator owned books to company owned books. Ah, uh, no. yeah. So, so uh, Hank Vick is a, a regular of ours. He says there's Malibu stuff. I don't know. Am I a fraud? Vick knows so yeah. much about Malibu. Oh yeah. He, and, and here's the thing, Vick's like 16. <laughs> so how does he know any of it? <laughs> so it's like, yeah, but he knows so. He he'll he'll send me a message. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about that. He goes, yes, here's what blah, blah, blah. And I'm like. Okay, then, right? Wow. If you say so. <laughs> he, he knows us as the dollar bins. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The 50 cent. Uh, I've probably uh -oh. forgotten more than Vic knows. Right. He goes, whenever I try and sound like Roland, I go full on Falkland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So, so at the time at, at Malibu, the, you know, it was, it was uh, the office started growing faster than I think. Uh, we could keep up the but the editorial area was a just a bunch of desks that were not even cubes right so they were desks no. with yeah. sort of little yeah. areas that just you kind of shoved together out. as they would fit yeah yeah and um tom and our, didn't let y'all have more room tom come on now no we had because we had we had exploded we didn't realize we didn't realize how fast the space would fill because when we first moved in there it's like it's like when you get your first computer. Oh, I'll never fill this up. There's the, <laughs> right. and then you do. And you look at the old Malibu office on West in West Lake Village and you think, and the bullpen was shaped like a U, a U. And you think, um, Oh, we'll never fill this up. There's way too much space. And then it's like, well, you bring in some colorists and you bring in this other, you know, all the other people and everything, everything works fine. And then, you know, the more people come in, it's like, where are we going to put them? And then all of a sudden you have this sort of, instead of an organic sort of, feng shui flow chart where everything works perfectly it's like well these people just showed up so we put them over there Scrub a desk in here <laughs> yeah. so put you this know, desk on top of that desk tom maybe you can answer me a question because uh i cannot remember so i remember absolutely the you what i can't remember was what was inside the you Who there hasn't been a, there had to have been a room in there because the walls didn't connect so what was what was the space? What filled the space in between the two legs? So if you that came, was Tom's bat cave. That's, <laughs> so it was really just a wall. It was there wasn't really a space there. So there's the as you came in, there was the marketing area. So there's Alan Payne and Ty, and John Riley and Cosby and Ross. Right. They were all there, and then we were all at the bottom of the U. There uh -huh. was there was Stacy, and then me, and then Alm, and then. Dave and Kim Schulter were sort of at the, the the little connector of the U. Right. And then uh, Dan was next to Chris, and and I think Hank was over there too. And then uh -huh. Roland and Mike Brown were up towards the middle of the U near the art. Oh, the art yeah. room was in the U. The art room was in the That's U. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because because there was space there. there. Yeah. There was. I, I just couldn't remember what was in the was in the space. And, and I we remember were, briefly we were uh, moving everybody up. And we had uh, Schellinger and, was there, but uh, right by the door yes. that went into the colorist room. Mm. Right. And yeah. then all of, and then the, uh, um, cause we had, we had Will McGuire was in the, was, was in the back issue room. He was in the, <laughs> yeah. he was in the garage essentially. Yeah. Wow. Uh, oh, Mike Brown. I remember Mike. Yeah. yeah. Anyone mm -hmm. keep in touch with him? You know, I've looked for him on Facebook and different places. And Kara, uh, Kara says she bumped into him at a at a, like a little league game of uh, game of all places in Colorado. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Where did where did Roberta sit? <laughs> you know where I was in the group. We had a full set of desks. They were all flat and connected. So yeah, yeah. it was. We were just all they were in the warehouse. Yeah, we were completely shoulder to shoulder, just in a big yeah. line. Yeah. Until we moved to Calabasas. Yeah, they were in the warehouse. Yep. Yeah. And we moved to Calabasas so the company could be sold. We didn't really move to make more room for people. Hey, oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was I to didn't make either. more room. <laughs> uh, cause what, Nobody knew cause, that. Because the thing – so it's too bad that Bob Jacob won't sign in and, uh, and, and debate me. But um, <laughs> what happened is that he – they wanted to set it up so that the office looked like a stereotypical place, like a comic book office should look like. Uh, yeah. And so that's why all everything was bright colors and everything was, you know, in weird shapes and odd who, angles. Who was responsible for the 
freaking ugly desktops for all our cubes with the black <laughs> squiggly oh, worms. Well, I hope that wasn't you, Tom. That'd be Mr. Scott Rosenberg. Oh my uh, god. It we, took I, all the uh, it took a long time to get used to that with your eyes. Oh my I, gosh. I purposely had stacks of papers. Seriously, I really developed a bad habit to cover that desktop because it was it just it would yeah. it would uh, shimmer when you look yeah. when yeah. you look yeah. at it. The idea was oh, that it, so it was it was never designed for people to use. Yeah. It was never the, the thought of people there didn't matter. It was designed so that when Scott and Bob would parade people through, that it would Oof. look like their vision of a comic book office. Ugh. And so but you know, it, it really looks more like Joker Stemboy. Dan sort of Danko did the right thing and he put like two forty gallon fish tanks on, on his counters. So he oh, really? Because wow. I mean, the thing is we had, that, that's why the colorists had to block the uh, the fluorescent lights because yeah. they yeah. could they it couldn't work. And then, helpful. and then Scott yeah. and Bob would come in and they say, We can't have cardboard covering up the fluorescent lights. What will people think? It's like right. we're trying to color colors, here. Do you want the colors to work and be happy? Or do you want do you want Mr. Uh, Mr. Venture Capitalist to come in and uh, be happy. Wow. Yeah. Had no idea. Yeah. Well, so yeah. it, back in the old office then, uh, Chris and company were, were putting together the, the Ultraverse. I was in my uh, corner working on the Robotech and the Zillion books and all that kind of stuff. And I think Dave has told this story before, um, and certainly Chris has. But I, I just remember one day, having gotten a lot of the stuff done that I needed to get done, I I brought up to Chris. It's like, look, you know, you've got me on staff, but you're underutilizing me. Uh, like, put me in, coach. And right. and so I, I basically uh, ended up joining the Ultraverse uh, team after they had already done, like, their first Scottsdale meeting and all that kind of stuff. Um, but brought in some talent that uh, they hadn't they hadn't yet brought in um, and, and kind of went from there. You were the Perez Whisperer. Yeah, uh, Perez, Perez was a uh, was a good get. I thought. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I helped out with the Dan. Dan did most of the trading cards, but I helped get a couple of artists uh, for the trading card sets that we had done. Um, I, I wish I had sets of those. I don't. I don't have those anywhere. But they the they turned cards? out really nice. The trading cards. Yeah. Yeah. Three three big sets. Just yeah. so you know, Danko keeps mm -hmm. his in uh, three beautiful binders. Does he? Yes. I think I might have. He, can, he, he pulls them out. He, they're up on a. Uh, I don't know what his office is like now, but when we shared an office uh, after Malibu, yeah. he had a he had a beautiful, you know, a, a shelf, mm -hmm. with beautiful binders all ready to go. I think I've got a binder of them. Yeah, yeah. I do. Some, I do too. I've got some. I think y'all sent me a, several sets. I think it was something. Yeah. yeah, they were great. They were I great. Know, I have them. And uh, and the I think the the big one was when we uh, these ones. Yeah. 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 Aren't those great? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. like those, really did I like the painted dormant ones too. Oh yeah. So we did that for a couple of years, and then um, I, I found something that I don't think many people have seen, and I don't know where the original is because it was in it was in the Malibu art room when they shut things down. But I I have a photo. I found a photo stat of this. And uh, wow, oh, that's cool. nice. Oh, you from the this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I'm. You can bleep this or edit this in the. If it, it, it is public knowledge that at one point DC almost bought Malibu, right? Well, I can't stop. I can't stop yeah. shutting up about it. So go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that was so that that was the first time I went to New York with Roland too. Not yep. the first time I went to New York with Roland. It's the first time I'd ever been to New York. Same here with Roland. <laughs> um, and we and we were we had we met with the DC editors in secret. We had we actually ended up going to uh, a Time Warner building that DC was not in, and it was like on an HR floor. We met with Carlin, I think, um, maybe Paul, but definitely Carlin because Carlin was going to be the guy who would be working with us. Uh, and we were basically mapping out what the Malibu DC crossover to launch the right. announcement and and celebrate the purchase of DC. Um, would be so. Mike was very big on not doing the typical, right? So a lot of people were saying that that Prime and, and Superman should team up, but the better team up there was was absolutely Prime and Captain Marvel. And Ringo was a huge Captain Marvel fan, and we yeah. had gotten to do yeah. some things for us, and so we had him do that nice piece. I think there was a Batman Mantra crossover 
which would be like that's certainly atypical like again right. people would want wonder woman and, and mantra but yeah. we went for the atypical with batman mantra um we'd also gone off site before then and and put together a, a, a potential list of these kinds of things we'd all gone to uh palm springs yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and because i have i have the i have the original list and i think the the for the big crossover event was going to be uh, headlined by uh, Green Lantern. Huh. And, and subs and also, uh, and Hawkman was somewhere in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it was definitely Green Lantern because they were looking for something to kind of uh, reinvigorate the Green Lantern franchise. Right. Because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't anybody then. I mean, he right. wasn't, he became Green Lantern later, but he wasn't really. He was like the he, he was he was on a par with Metamorpho at that point. <laughs> Just about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we did that, and then um, and then you were talking about Perez um, about I want to say three years ago. I came across an eBay listing, which uh, and again I don't know what happened to all the art in there, but I found on eBay some guy selling this, and this was like this was great for me because it was a character Siren that I had created. Oh, yeah, yours. Yeah. Yeah, the Ultraverse, oh, and this was nice. just on sale for uh, a couple hundred bucks on uh, on eBay. It's it's it was an unused Ultraverse cover. I think the uh, by the time the cover came in, um, Marvel had laid off uh, my round. There were several rounds of layoffs, so I think uh, I was I was in the second or third round. I think. Uh, so the, by time uh, by time the issue was going to come out, they had either canceled the series or wrapped up the series. But George still did the piece, um, and so so I saw that, and I just I, I put in a high bid and just watched. It's, it's mine, night, you know. <laughs> yeah. nice. So I would like to tell my Hank George Perez story. Yes, to, yeah, because, it, sure. because mm -hmm. it, it makes me look bad, and so I, yeah, <laughs> I but I genuinely like it because. I remember, I remember when uh, we we came up with the idea of doing Ultra Force as the as a book, and I think uh, Chris had sent out proposals to the founding writers and said, mm -hmm. "Come up with something." And then they sent proposals back, and Jerry Jones was the one who, who won. Yeah. The winner. And we're all uh -huh. sitting, and we're all sitting, and I can't remember if this was a formal meeting in in Chris's office or an editorial meeting, or if it just was a, a conversation that was in passing. But I remember Hank speaking up and saying hey it'd be great if we could get george perez to draw ultra force and i remember being the idiot saying you go right ahead hank you call george perez see what he, see see what he says and hank, comes back, <laughs> hank comes back like two hours later and says yeah george will do it and like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, it took like no time at all because he's he's the perez whisperer <laughs> george is great rest yeah. in peace that yeah. is an awesome story too yeah, <laughs> I do love that story. I'll never get tired of you telling that. <laughs> He'll never get tired of telling it. No, I because I because it's it, it's it's one of those things where you can be you can be a smart ass and think that you're correct, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, in two hours you're like the idiot. You're the you know, you're completely wrong, and because because now you would look at it, and I would, you know, now that I've had some therapy, you would just look at it and go, you could you could go. Hey Hank, that's a really good idea. You should you should call George and see what happens. And that's give it a shot. Give it a shot. And, yep. You know, but back then I was a younger, stupider person. <laughs> we all were. And so, <laughs> but it, we all were. It worked out because Perez Perez totally makes that book. He oh, makes yeah. it work. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That and guy's it, amazing. It, it appeals to the thing that I liked about him, which is I read one time where he wanted to basically. Before he passed away, he wanted to be able to say he drew almost every superhero possible. Yeah. And so yeah. we got him close to that. Yeah, well, he did. And, he and, came real close. And, you know, I don't know uh, if you guys remember, but you remember um, uh, he did a, a wraparound cover for Genesis Zero, which got just about every one of the characters from the Genesis world in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And we, al we also brought in some non-traditional Perez inkers. Like, we didn't use the usual suspect inkers. Right. Yeah, then Steven. Steven, yeah, Steven worked with him on some. Yeah. Steven was telling me about that. I'm like, why are you winking George Perez? I don't get it. 
Because it's George Perez. No, I know why you would do it, but I'm like, why did they ask you to do it? This is, uh, this is well, well, also, truth be told, he would also run very, very close to deadline, if not past yeah. deadline. And so we yeah. would have to have we'd have to engage multiple injuries to get it done. Oh yeah. yeah. So. Oh yeah. Well, and Stephen Stephen's work at the time certainly was 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 uh, heavily uh, Perez influenced. And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think you know there were a few pages which Perez didn't quite finish. Um, well, as, Stephen as, could always you know, Stephen draw, you know, kind of finished him. Yeah. Styles, yeah. I, I don't know that there was a lot of pages that way, but um, wasn't, wasn't my book. I just got to see the art as it came in. So. <laughs> Well, that was so. That's I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but that's one of the things I miss about comics that don't that doesn't exist now is when you could see the book come in from FedEx mm -hmm. and you could hold the original art in your hand and you could it felt like a thing. Yeah. Whereas now, now you're just looking at it on the computer, and I understand right. that, you know, it's faster and it's e you know it's easier, whatever. But I really like the idea of holding original art in my hand and reading a book from the original art Be being able to smell the cigarette smoke when you open the package from dan and david day <laughs> <That's> right, right? <laughs> you, could, you could always tell which half dozen graders were avid smokers oh yeah <laughs> yeah See, well the worst was, part uh, though is when FedEx list, was... the artist shopping list where they would write stuff on the <laughs> right yeah milk cheese yeah <laughs> all the time just yeah. scribble on whatever you want to somebody yell at you something you just make a note on the side of the paper yeah the worst uh, was when FedEx was running late, though, and oh, like, yes. they wouldn't deliver. And then, and then uh, I don't, you know, if you remember, I, I think the guy we had a couple of people do it, but uh, when when the person who have to check the stuff in would take freaking forever to check in your pages, and then right, you know, <laughs> they're delivering the pages like at three o'clock in the afternoon. Like, I needed these earlier. <laughs> yeah, because well, that, yeah. that's that's the other thing too. You would sort of if when FedEx would show up at nine thirty or ten. You could easily plan your day. Okay, this is the thing that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. But if it, if it's not, and you're you're waiting for pages because you have to turn a book around quickly, you just you can't really do anything else. You know you're supposed to, but you're really just sort of, you know, you're yep. pacing the floor. You're walking into the the shipping room saying, "Is he here yet? Is he here yet?" Right. You're, looking down, you're looking down the street to see if you can spot the truck. We've even we even had days where one of us would get in the car and sort of drive around and see if we <laughs> and so, <laughs> we're expecting pages today. Why 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 aren't they? Here? Oh no. Here you go. Those this, guys this is... said that they sent something. You got the tracking information. They they those lying artists, they didn't send nothing. Yeah. They lied. Hey, this is an important question from Hyper Potato, who is uh -huh. uh, who is a is a fan of Silverline. Uh, and a big supporter. We we love Hyper. He says, Hank, how much do you love Sergeant Rock? <laughs> is Hyper a huge Sergeant Rock guy? He is a very huge Sergeant Rock fan. Yeah. Well, yeah, I love Kubert's work on Sergeant Rock. That's yeah. like, you know, it, it, you can't have one without the other. Yep, agreed. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. yeah and, and, oh. and in fact, he's going to quiz Tom sometime about Easy Company, I think. <laughs> well, because, well, my favorite character was Wild Man. So. <laughs> But actually, I'm, I'm more of a gunner and sarge person. So <laughs> we should we should sort of segue into what Hank is doing now. Yeah, well, I was going to say I have more questions, uh, but but uh, you, Roberta, Tommy, uh, Dave, y'all got any questions? I think I'm caught up enough for his past. So yeah, I don't know what he's up to now, and I'd love yeah. to hear it. That's so, my question. Well, if we fast forward to what I'm doing now, that's uh, I mean, you skip over about 25 years. I was going to say, well, you spent it, a lot of years at DC. Yeah. Uh, give, give us uh, give us some highlights of DC. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot just of so years. So many. <laughs> well, I mean, so like really quick then. Uh, okay. Uh, Mar uh, Marvel laid a bunch of us off. Uh, the my severance package from Marvel actually um, expired on a Friday in March. And then my first day on the job at Warner Brothers started the, the next Monday, just by sheer happenstance. Um, uh, um, started, uh, started there uh, working for uh, a department that ended up call being called Brain Assurance, but they were moving the functionality of Brain Assurance from New York, the DC offices in New York, to Burbank. California. And I had, uh, w when I was working on Ultra Force, I also, one of the jobs that I, I had absorbed at the company was working on some of the licensed stuff. So 
not the Sega Genesis game, but uh, the Ultra Force Galoo toy line. Um, the and, cartoon. And, and mm-hmm. he, the cartoon and yep. the merchandise that was, was being developed there. So with that experience, um, I, I got a, a job that they had posted and uh, needed uh, in Burbank that people with uh, experience in the comic book uh, industry. So, so I ended up working with DC uh, quite closely from that point forward. Um, and then uh, took an eight year break from comics to travel the world as, as Warner's uh, director of theme park licensing. So uh, the way I'd be introduced at, at meetings was this is Hank. He gets to travel the world and ride roller coasters for a living, which, uh, <laughs> which is pretty true. And it, it was probably one of the best jobs that you could ever have. Um, uh, and a lot of that again was the DC stuff because you have your all the rides and all the merchandise. Um, but but in addition to DC, all the Looney Tunes characters, all the Warner Bros. characters, all the Hanna Barbera characters. Um, and it was my job to a lot of time at Six Flags and stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Um, that was a 55 year deal, 55 year uh contract that they have had. Um, with uh, with the company, and uh, and then one time, uh, was in a meeting with with Paul. We were going over a, a stunt show with the Six Paul, Flags Paul folks, Levitz. Paul Levitz uh, at DC. And after that meeting, you know, he kind of pulled me aside and and he said, you, you know, you're at a point in your life now where you you can make a decision what you want to do with your career. You can kind of go down this path that you're on and maybe get a job at Imagineering and and you know really kind of expand your skill set there. Or you can come work for me at DC and uh, broaden your skill set um, with us. And it's like, wow, that's that's awesome. Uh, and I just kept that in the back of my head. It, uh, I was in Spain building a park, Movie World Madrid, Warner Bros. Movie World Madrid. Um, when I landed, uh, it was on 9-11 and, and the... <laughs> Airport was completely empty. Had no, they didn't tell us while we were on the plane what had happened. So, yeah. we get in the car and uh, dropped off at the hotel. The hotel was like, you know, have you checked in uh, at home? And it's like, you know, why would I do that? And yeah. they said, we'll go up to your room and watch the news. And so, turn that on. Tried to get a hold of my wife. We just had our first uh, first child born. Couldn't get through for eight or nine hours finally got through and she was, she was a mess. And she basically said, I, you know, I can't deal with you traveling so much. So I uh, got home, called up Paul said, all right, it's, it's time. And, uh, and I started working at DC. So Paul was the Hank whisperer. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> it was interesting because he, so he tells me, he goes, I keep, I keep, I keep my, I keep tabs on people who I come across over the years and you hit our radar back in the early nineties when image started as someone that we might want to bring on staff. And basically Tom, everything that you were saying is like, you know, every, every interaction you have with them. Right. Proved more and more. That's like, well, we could work with this guy. So it turns out that, um, so, so flashback to one of my early jobs when I worked for Bob Wayne, he ended up, selling his stores and moving to New York and working for DC as their, as their sales, uh, the head of sales. I think at the time it was the director of sales, but he worked his way up to, to, right. you know, the top sales position, like a vice president or senior vice president um, of sales. And he had actually recommended the same thing. It's like, well, you know, I used to work, yeah, this guy used to work for me in my store. He'd be really good. Um, so Paul had been paying attention to what I was doing without telling me he was paying attention what I was doing and um, and then had a good solid six to eight years of interaction with him when I was at Warner Brothers to the point where he felt super comfortable with bringing me on to DC. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, nice. after after Malibu then, so this is like cut to uh, today, uh, I'm the publisher of Clover Press. Um, we're a small boutique publisher um, based out of San Diego. Uh, I'm, I'm in the like North Los Angeles area. I'm in Thousand Oaks, which is northwest of of Los Angeles. Um, very close, actually, to to Duo and um, and the original Malibu offices. And the original Malibu offices. 
And, um, and so Dave, down the street circle. from from me, I'm in Simi Valley. So, all right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. cool. <laughs> and we we were in Simi yeah. for a while. We were up in and, and Roberta too, right? And me too. Yeah, I'm in yeah. Granada Hills. Where are you? Granada Hills. Oh, Granada Hills. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a papaya um, nursery. No, I went to Disneyland I last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it doesn't count. Uh, uh, Hank, uh, Vic has a really important question for okay. you here. He said, uh, "Would you ever do any work for Silverline?" <laughs> so you know when when uh, when Warner Brothers had their huge layoffs. Um, because of the AT&T purchase, um, I was one of the casualties there. And uh, Roland was very generous uh, to offer me some work at Silverline. And um, I, would, I, will, I do and still consider it. Um, the, the, my focus right now uh, really is a, a couple different things. I have some clients that, uh, that I consult for and uh, running Clover Press as, as the publisher. So yeah, so when it's you, when it's time to write that? superhero comics again, I'm the you know first place I'll take it will be to Roland. There That's you go, great. there you go, Vic. We and this awesome. is all broadcast live, so you can't no take backsies. Yeah. <laughs> so are you are you the founder of Clover Press or no? So um so there uh, there's a uh, there's a company called IDW that was founded by uh, Ted Adams and Robbie Robbins. And uh, they right. built that company up into a multi-million dollar corporation. And um, they decided to leave in 2019 and start Clover Press. And uh, I started sending my resume out in 2021. And um, I, I sent it to Ted, because um, Ted knows everybody. And I say, hey, I mean, hey Ted, I'm, I'm available to for work if you know of anyone. Uh, please share my resume. And he, he called me that day and goes, it's really weird that you sent this to me. Cause I was just thinking about this. I'm, I'm thinking of retiring. And if you're interested in taking over as publisher, we'd, we'd love to have you over at Clover. And again, with Ted, um, a, another publishing company in San Diego, we'd grab lunch once in a while um, and just compare notes about the business and how things are going and things that we could work on together. Um, and so he felt very comfortable with bringing me on board and, uh, so that was right I, before IDW had their their financial problems, wasn't it? Uh, when they left, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah was, a, they a left. Years. They left, and then about a year later, IDW got into so, some financial. So stuff, that's yeah. how you got those cool Terry and the Pirates books, too, right? Exactly right. Yeah. So, uh, so, mm-hmm. so again, full circle. One of my earliest jobs in comics was was doing uh, uh, articles for Comic Scene, and one of my one of the articles I did was on the big. Marvel Wolfman an Eclipse crossover. So they hired, you know, Marv Crisis on Infinite Earths Wolfman to kind of do the same thing with all the series that Eclipse Comics was was publishing at the time. Um, so I interviewed Dean and Cat Ironwood and uh, Marv Wolfman for that article. And uh, Dean has really dedicated his life to preserving some of these old uh, old books. Um, uh, that would actually make my bookshelf fall apart, I think. Um, so we're, we're doing these great uh, oversized Terry and the Pirates books. We, uh, we just released uh, Dick Tracy as well. We'll be doing Dick Tracy in hardcover and then um, a couple other things planned for, for, for the LOAC, the Library of American Comics. Really cool stuff. Nice. Um, but at Clover, we, we do like higher end coffee table books. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, we, we found... Very similar to Silverline, uh, that Kickstarter is a great way to get these projects uh, to to the public. Um, yeah. Direct to consumer is uh, is something that for these kinds of books works really well. Yeah. Um, retailers can't necessarily take a chance. I wish that more of them would, and I think they're uh, really missing out by not paying attention to what's on Kickstarter because I think they can pick up a lot of projects that they otherwise would not be picking up. Yeah. Um, but we do we do a lot of nice high end hardcover coffee table books. We've got a uh, a Godzilla Kong book coming out really soon. Uh, we just uh, pre launched uh, this fantastic Bella Lugosi uh, biography. It's it's the definitive biography of Bella Lugosi uh, by Robert Kramer. It's uh, it's going to be well over seven hundred pages with uh, oh, tons of photos and like photos of artifacts that no one's seen. 
uh, from the family archives. Yeah, it's, wow. it's nice. just beautiful. Um, yeah, that'll be launching this week uh, uh, on Kickstarter. We pre-launched it, so give it a follow. Uh, we also have another book called The Mask of Hylia, uh, and that is, is really kind of near and dear for me because it, it's a book that's by all women and um, all Asian creators, and it's uh, based and steeped in Filipino mythology and uh, learned a lot actually about Filipino mythology in the last year working with these ladies, um, which is something that growing up, you know, a couple of times my mom would bring the stuff up, but not always. But one in particular, she she believes you should never have your bed under your uh, window in your bedroom because that's that's how you're taken by some trolls, some Filipino trolls as a, <laughs> as a kid. But it's, it's Filipino feng shui, I guess. Um, and uh, and that's how you keep your kids in line, right? That's but okay. uh but this is like so this is something really special so that's a kickstarter that's running right now it's called mask of hylia and the uh, the too. limbs are uh, are they're wonderful oh, folks yeah oh it's great art yeah that's high name that's nice looking yeah thank you um so what it's a wonderful book so it's it's and uh, it's important to them too for representation that it's that it's all all women and um all asian so it's authentic um and you know, you guys have all heard the stories about like Whoopi Goldberg wanting to be part of Star Trek because she grew up seeing Uhura right. uh, on the bridge. It's the same right. thing with with comics. Um, for for a very very long time, it's been nothing but um, white folks, and uh, with the occasional exception here and there, obviously. Um, but this was this is an important one, and then. Uh, well Go ahead. But it also seems like it's, in terms of representation and stuff like that, it also seems like it's a great idea that it's uh, like a coffee table hardcover. This is, yeah, this is a deluxe book. So, so they did it as a comic, and this is a, so this is a deluxe hardcover with a slipcase. Um, yeah, that, so this is something. Seemed, that, go ahead. This, this is something great that you'd be very proud to have on your coffee table in your yeah, book. Yeah, and it looks, it, I think it makes it more real because it's a, yeah. it's a, a book book. And so I think that lends it lends to the importance of it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And Filipinos have played such an important role in, in American comics. Oh, um, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Certainly Filipino comics, but I mean, so many talented artists have come from the Philippines or are in the Philippines right now, too. Well, as as a as a kid, I grew up reading. I, I remember when they when the, the collective sort of came over to the U.S. and they started drawing the the uh, what are called the mystery books for D.C., Yes, and I started seeing all their all the cool stuff and all the different styles, yeah. and that to me was eye opening because I was right. seeing I was seeing non traditional art that wasn't just superhero art. It was more illustrated. Yeah. It was more evocative. It was it was fun to see. They can get, definitely capture a mood, for sure. Yeah. So, and then we have you know uh, I don't know if you want to pull it up too, uh, Roland. If you're in the plane up, uh, but Immortal is uh, in another important Kickstarter that we've got um, coming up. That'll be coming up uh, top of November. Um, but that's uh, that's the next issues in a series of books that are all based in uh, uh, the work of Xiao Yi, um, fantastic wuxia, uh, fantasy martial arts stories that are kind of taking place in different eras. We have a couple modern day series plus um uh, a series that takes place during the uh boxer uprising what's and then a great I'm not, series I'm not, I'm not getting something i'm not getting anything on the no put in a uh, put in assassin g it should come up and uh and Assassin's G actually takes place in the 80s. So it's it, that's a nice throwback, especially for oh, here we go. people in, in my age bracket. So <laughs> that's my sweet spot. So yeah, we're doing all that. Keeping busy. Sounds like it. Keeping super the, busy. The art that's books the one. are so lovely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's really nice. Nice. So, so those are coming up, and then um, another thing that we're doing on a clover. So when, when I when I first started chatting with them, wanted to get a feel for the things that they like and the things that I like. You know, I I've, I've always been very art focused 
artist focused. Um, you, you know, even back on, on Ultra Ultraverse, that would be my focus is, is how can we get the best possible artists on these series? Um, so we, we're doing a series of books called the, the uh, Marvel Art of, and uh, we, we've already done three. We did one for David Mack, one for Alex mm -hmm. Malev, and then one for uh, David Nakayama. And the goal for me is to like, kind of bring a whole range of different artists from different eras and different fan bases and really kind of present their art and put them on a pedestal more more so than uh, in the past, right? And and focus on some of their processes, focus on their covers. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a program where we have like a, about 200 page coffee table book, plus uh, a portfolio that collects some of their best pieces is you know, 12 plates, 12 to 14 plates in each portfolio. And then if, if they have it like a sketchbook, those are the kinds of things you can get at conventions, but opening it up so that you don't have to go to a convention to get these things. Uh, and of course they'll have it at conventions if they go, but, um, uh, but it's a nice celebration of the artists at Marvel. Uh, we have a, a, a really nice roster for 2024. Um, and we announce them when we go live. Right. So, uh, right. so I, can, I can't tell you, but, but I, I can say, awesome. I can say that I've seen the uh, the stuff for the David David Nakayama stuff, and it, it looks beautiful. I mean, Thank I've you. oh I've been a huge fan of his. You know, I've talked with him at conventions, and you know, a few things on Facebook as well. But yeah. the book is really mm -hmm. nicely done. It's yeah. really beautiful. So thank you. So, well, I mean, and it's all David. It's, it's his work that makes it look so good. But yeah, but, but Robbie but, does our design work. Robbie Robbins, and he's he's a fantastic book designer. Yeah, but it's good presentation and everything, which is you guys. Yeah. So, thank you. Awesome. So I have a question. Yes. So I'm looking at the website, and you did uh, Carmen, the graphic novel based on the uh, the opera, right? That's right. P. Craig so, Russell. Given given that you work in comics, how many people come up to you and pronounce it Carmen? I will say zero. See, they're learning. But nice. Yes, they are learning. Carmen. <laughs> it's no like Transformers, but they're cars. Yeah. We've got, uh, we do, so there's, uh, we did this novel by uh, uh, Ricardo Delgado, who had done uh, uh, Age of Reptiles with Dark Horse. Um, he wrote this, it's like a 500 page novel, his take on, on Dracula of Transylvania. And he, um, he did this art section of the back. This is before I joined, joined Clover, this, this prose book. Um, we had, they had finished it right when I joined the company. But there was this um, section of art in the back that were some of his character designs. And so I, I was talking to him about what his next project would be. And he's got, he's got a lot of projects, some really interesting ones that we'll be bringing out through Clover. But but people really gravitate towards his art. And so it's like, ah, man, it's a, sh it's a shame that we ran all the art in the book. If you had a couple more pieces, you know, we could have done a, an art book. He goes, oh, I've got like, I've got like over 200 pieces of, the, of, of designs. And it's just like, ding. In time, you get like 140 to 200 pieces of art. I, I could put a really nice art book together. So uh, that, was, that was a great campaign that we ran earlier. Um, and the book's doing really well. And um, from that, from all those designs, Delgado has designed a tarot card set, and so we're going to be releasing Ooh. that. And so we we we're doing all sorts of different projects. Uh, and again, we do pride ourselves on the eclectic part of the description of uh, of how we describe ourselves. We're an eclectic publisher. Um, mm -hmm. Robbie's an avid fisherman, and so he connected with an artist, Ray Troll. So we we're, we're doing the. Uh, spawn and spawn till you die the fin art of rachel here's this guy who's been drawing for 40 plus years he's got installations at the smithsonian and aquariums across the world uh, uh very big in the pacific northwest he's had over you know several million t-shirts of his artwork made over the years so we're we're collecting all of his art in fact he had a snowboard that was made from one of his pieces of art. And there's this, there's this YouTube, I'll, I can send you a link and you can put it in uh, the comments wherever you're going to put this video. Um, there's a snowboarder who, uh, who was buried 
and, and another snowboarder found him and rescued him. And the, the reason why is he saw out of the corner of his eye when he was snowboarding down this hill, this bright red snowboard and it happened to be Rachel's art. And so, so it was a big story uh, earlier in the, early this year. Um, tremendously talented artist. Um, he, he does uh, a lot of paleontology art, but then he also does a lot of uh, gags, right? So a lot of dad jokes is what I would, would call them. Right <laughs> up in Tom's alley. I That's love it. Right. I, 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 I love dad jokes. I need this book. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. Great, great dad, jazz, dad joke for you, right? Uh, and then I got another question for you. So, what did the janitor say when he came out of the closet? I don't know. Supplies. Oh, oh that's awful. <laughs> that's, that's terrible. <laughs> so, Hank, so one of the, one of the things that uh, that uh, I wanted to ask you for some time now is what is exactly is the relationship? Because I know you, you you work with Immortal Studios, but then you're actually the, the publisher for Clover Press. What is the relationship between those two? Because don't aren't you also some some yeah. don't you hold a position at, at Immortal Studios as well? Yeah. So uh, okay. no 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 relation. It's just okay. uh, you just got two gigs. Yeah, I'm a busy guy. Uh, <laughs> I got I got a couple other gigs that aren't as visible. Um, you know, it, it, so, I'm aware of one of them. Believe it or not. Yeah. I mean, hi, <laughs> highlights. So highlights of DC. I mean, there's. 25 years are so many but um getting to make a four minute batman ride film that was that was a highlight that was that was an amazing time and i can say that i that i uh was a producer on a batman short film so that was cool um launching digital comics for dc you know yeah. dragging them kicking and screaming into the digital age that was that was an interesting time too because uh so many people were super resistant to doing it they thought it would it would be the end of print well, comics and it was anything but well that's one of the um, things that actually you and i talked about that uh, when i the one of the times when i was out at san diego and and uh we we grabbed a quick lunch and we yeah. talked about digital comics i don't know if you remember that or not yeah no absolutely i and and i it, it's still the future that's where yeah. that's that's where we're going to uh, expand our our audience but i remember having a, a retailer meeting where we would invite all our retailers in, into Burbank. We, we had them at a theater. We had a big, big to do. And like they, it, they literally had, well, not literally, because literally, I mean, they would actually have them, but they had pitchforks out ready to <laughs> spike all of us. And they were so, and, and it, came, it came from fear, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but then when we launched and they, and the bottom didn't fall out of their business. And in fact, their business grew. They finally came around. Well, actually, Really, only a few retailers came back to apologize at, at the the approach that they took. For the most part, everyone else just sort of hoped that it would be ignored and it would go away. But they were just they were just downright nasty. Yeah. Um. Uh, and, and and certainly in the years since, that is how audiences have grown. People can discover comics digitally, and then they go in and get the collected or the or the print books. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really strong. It's it's how uh, web webtoons and mantra, yeah. or manta Huge. and and some of the others are just they Tapas. just yeah they, it's yeah. Just, it's you the the reason why comics grew on the newsstand is because that's the place where the kids went yes now the kids are on their phone so if comics want to succeed in capturing those kids it's not about bringing the newsstand back it's about right. going to the phone it's right. it's go where the exactly. kids are. fish yeah. where the fish are is what we we'd say. People yeah. always say mm -hmm. that, right? So, you know, so like a, a nice high-end hardcover coffee table book doesn't work as great on your phone. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and and I still I do love my books. I do I do love um, I do love and, and again, that was like the best person to have in charge of digital comics is someone who loves the tangible book, right? Because you're not yeah. going to do anything to jeopardize that. But a lot of internal. We'll call them discussions um, on how to roll things out. Um, uh, so that was highlight uh, uh, running Vertigo. Uh, that was a terrific highlight. Um, uh, the 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 job I had uh, worked towards every job I had at DC. I sort of pretty much well, kind of going back to how things were at, at Malibu. Like they they were kind of jobs of my making. Seeing. Uh, uh, something that I could do to help and uh, and then offering to do that and then having that suggestion 
accepted and then and and then done. So uh, I, I ended up uh, running the content strategy for the company. That was you know, figuring out with with Dan and Bob and Jim, like what we were publishing, what format we were publishing it, what cadence, what price point, things like that. Uh, and then had sales and marketing. Dan, Dan had wanted me in charge of sales and marketing uh, for a while, and it was something that I wasn't as interested in. And then as things got restructured a few times over, uh, it, it ended up falling under my purview. Um, and so learned quite a bit doing that. And then, um, you know, when, when I became available outside of DC, uh, I have a, I have a pretty, pretty good size plate to fill and I've been doing that. So, so, so different parts of my experience set, from my years uh, up until that point, people come knocking on the door asking for that kind of help. And if, it, if it's a good fit, that's what I do. Most excellent. Yeah. Um, well, my clock tells me that uh, uh, we should end it a few minutes ago, but it has been fun. Uh, a couple things, Hank. Uh, can, we, can we ask you to come back? Sure. I hope it won't Absolutely. take another th three years to, uh, to say yes. <laughs> no. No, although I feel like I I I talked about everything, so I'm not sure there's anything left. Well, you know, no, there's a lot of yeah. We, in there. we can tell, yeah, yeah, just the generalness of stuff. You can yeah. get into detail. This, this, is, are... this is the overview. This is the book jacket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we well, still, wait, we go ahead, Tom. When I when I uh, get to the middle part of my history of the ultraverse, um, I, mm -hmm. I I'll definitely want to talk to you. Um, but also when you get your next book out and when your That'd next book goes live, we should do. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Come on. Cool. Well, yeah. You know, if you guys want uh, Lynn Lugosi and, uh, and uh, Robert Kremer, when the Lugosi book goes live, I'd be happy to bring mm -hmm. them. That would be great. Uh, oh, yeah. Those yeah, guys absolutely. are, they have stories. Let me tell you. That okay. sounds great. Yeah. yeah Very I think cool. That would be because we run, we're live, aren't we, Roland? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. And then, but you also rebroadcast as a podcast, right? Yep, we sure do. That's why I try to, at the very beginning, I try to get you all to say just a hello after I say your name, just so people can put a, a voice with a name. Uh, we, uh, we, we stream. We're streaming live now on uh, eight different platforms. So we're on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, two YouTube channels, two Twitch channels, and also Twitter. So... And then, um, and then, of course, the YouTubes uh, will be up perpetually. So, and then if the Roku deal goes through, you'll be on Roku. Mm -hmm. Yep. If if uh, Roku happens, then we'll also be on Roku. We're, they're still wow. uh, still trying to get that. Yeah, still trying to get that happening. Uh, the so uh, network that we're part of is is uh, running the Kickstarter right now, trying to raise money to to make the move to a. Yeah. A, yeah, a yeah. So Roku I think channel. I think if Hank if Hank has a, a thing he wants to promote and you, you want to bring some of the creators on who want to chat. That seems absolutely like, that'd be cool yeah, that seems like and, and, and we've got we've got three different streams uh this is the of course this, this is the team that well except for except for dave uh this is the team for uh sunday and then what we have, have a two dave? no no, no, no <laughs> dave, dave's part of the no dave's Plus part of the tuesday stream is what yeah, I'm dave, get out of here tuesday. <laughs> he's, he's part of the tuesday team uh we, we have a team this tuesday that the, they stream later um, so I think it's, uh, 8 PM your time that they stream. Cause it's like yep. 11. Ble yeah. So 8 PM your time. And then Wednesday, uh, we have another team, uh, a different team, uh, that does the same time as we do. So we're the fun. Uh, crowd. We are the fun crowd. We, we are the fun one. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, we're the fun. in fact, hyper says always fun. Y'all would love to hear more from Hank. So see there, Hank, yeah. uh, right. hyper wants you back. And then he always reminds uh, everyone who is watching and whether this is live or whether this is on the repeat, like mm -hmm. and subscribe, everyone. Please do, uh, you know, all the algorithms. It helps us. So it, it, it doesn't cost you anything to do either. So uh, so please do that. Uh, last thing, Hank, is uh, we, we, we do a little thing here uh, when we sign off that we, we, we all have a tendency to say, make mine silver line. So uh, you'll see uh, we have a recording here. Uh, it, it, may I ask you, I'll put you solo on the screen and may I ask you just say, hi, I'm, I'm Hank and Alts, make mine silver line. And then what I'll do is I'm going to clip that and use it, uh, for our closing, uh, in the future. All right. 
You up to that? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, so, oh, wait, before I forget, uh, I almost forgot. I almost forgot this last week, too. So, um, shouldn't he say, make mine so, shouldn't he say, I'm Hank Canals from Clover Press? Make mine yes. so, yes, make mine so, uh-huh. Uh-huh. yes, all right, uh huh. Uh-huh. 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 So, <laughs> Uh, so on uh, Tuesday, don't forget about our other streams. On Tuesday, uh, that Silver Line show on Tuesday, they're going to be playing Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, they have roped me into joining them again uh, for their Halloween edition. Uh, we will be uh, role playing. Um, My game. first time. Dave's first time. I did it last year with them, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, on Wednesday, then, our Wednesday crew is going to be talking about writing comedy oh in which uh tom is going to be there uh <laughs> well, for, enough. yeah for the, for those who so the, if you know tom you know you just laugh at him uh <laughs> but but tom wrote uh, for malcolm in the middle he wrote for super normal and he also wrote of course uh, for you comic book geeks he wrote uh dinosaurs for hire and so tom knows a little uh, thing about uh comedy uh next and week we'll be back and we're gonna... what's that the fresh beat band I, the fresh I fell out That's of my right. chair. I was watching that with my kids. And it's like, Tom Mason, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> this is an awesome <laughs> show. Me and, uh, me and Danko, we were on staff there. We were uh, so <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. I, I, no, I, no, I no. Your, this... your, uh, your spiel there. So. That's quite all right. Uh, next week, we're going to be back. We'll be here, uh, same bad time, same bad channel, and we're going to do a round robin q and I'm stealing a, a page from Barb's book uh, a few weeks ago. She did a round robin Q&A, and we're just going to – I'm going to uh, uh, post some questions to these folks uh, who are here, and we're just going to do some answers as we just kind of go around. Be important questions like, uh, like you know, are, are hot dogs considered uh, sandwiches? No <laughs> yeah. answers right now. That's, I, that's I was going to say, are you going to ask that question? I, I'm, I'm going to ask that question but but no answers now that's for next no no i'm sorry you opened the door a hot dog is a (laughs) hot dog is an alabama taco well i'll have to dig up some different questions so uh so for now <laughs> Hank, I'm, gonna pull, I'm gonna pull you up and then we're gonna go to uh, our uh if you want to if you have some time hang out uh pull you up we'll let you do your thing i'm gonna go to the closing thing and then you can watch that little blue bar along the bottom and that'll I'm tell you when we're thing. when we're over you should be All able right. to see something right here that probably says live Mm-hmm. Uh, and that'll tell you when we're are not live anymore. And so. then we'll see if Roberta hangs through to the end. Go <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick on Roberta. All right, so here we go, Hank. I'm Hank from Clover Press. Make mine silver line. My name is Ross Ritchie from Boom Studios, and make mine silver line.